Um, just a few preliminary notes. Um, uh, all the um, quotations and images that I give here are from our um, family's collection unless otherwise indicated. And um, also, I, I tend to refer to Valentino as Rodolfo before he actually becomes famous. And as I'm primarily dealing with the pre-fame Valentino, um, I use Rodolfo um, primarily. Can you explain your relationship? I do. I, I do. <laughs> I never expected that I would become my great-granduncle's biographer. It is true that growing up, I knew the iconic image of Rudolph Valentino well. That famous face, framed by a smooth sheen of hair, with its insolent gaze and flared nostrils exhaling clouds of sensuous gray smoke. More than most girls my age, I was familiar with the flickering images of Valentino as the tangoing gaucho and the Bernouze shrouded chic, and even the handsome young man in the impeccable 20s suit whose expression was distant, intangible, yet uncannily familiar. From my family, I had also heard stories of Uncle Rudy. My great-grandfather, Alberto, would recall riding horses with his famous brother through the rugged, desolate canyons of Beverly Hills. And my grandfather, Gene, reminisced about afternoons with his uncle, lost in a game of battleship, toy boats bobbing through the courtyard fountains of Falcon Lair, Valentino's estate, where my great-grandparents and grandfather had lived right before Valentino's death. I heard of Uncle Rudy's charm, of his generosity, and of his sad life. It was only following the death of my grandfather that we found a dozen or so tattered boxes of old family documents that had been stored away for decades in a seldom used closet. No one knew they existed, but as it turned out, the boxes contained an in invaluable assemblage of Valentino's papers. Intermixed with yellow stacks of magazines and newspaper clippings were unpublished photographs, childhood papers, civil documents, business correspondence, legal contracts, telegrams, genealogical records, um, Valentino's own genealogical records, memoranda, fan letters, and so on. But most importantly, there were letters. Letters not just about Valentino by those who knew him intimately, but also Valentino's own correspondence with his mother, with his family, and his friends. The discovery of these documents began my search for Valentino, a journey that has since led me to archives in Italy and the United States, and to private collections generously made available by their owners. Centrally, the Valentino that has emerged from this exploration is a man who, although he became in many respects the face of the Jazz Age, was never personally able to reconcile the values he had been born into with those of the era he was helping usher in. Um, as others have pointed out, the emergence of Valentino as a phenomenon coincides with deep shifts in American culture as the nation abandoned Victorianism for modernity as the population balance shifted from rural to urban, and as the cultural, fo fo cultural focus moved from highbrow Europe to more populist homegrown products, such as motion pictures. What I have traced out more intimately and in more, and in more detail is the way in which coming to America activated in Valentino a similar set of cultural dislocations. Valentino's tragedy, and I think his story is a tragic one, is that he could not successfully negotiate identities. He never found a way either to let go of his Italian values or to reconcile them with American culture. And I can find it again. <laughs> And um, as we see here, this is a letter, um, the envelope of the first letter he wrote to his mother um, from the United States. And in this letter, he included 
these two flags, one of Italy and one of the United States. He wrote Viva America and Viva l'Italia on the respective flags. I think it reflects his optimism that he might retain a balance between the two cultures. But unfortunately, such a felicity honor. Mencken, the detached observer, spares neither his boorish compatriots nor the stiff-necked star, unable to throw off his outmoded European sensibility and roll with the punches. Yet Mencken perceives that the confrontation presents genuine psychological stakes for Valentino. Here was a man, Mencken speculates, of relatively civilized feelings thrown into a situation of impulsible vulgarity. Had he achieved out of nothing a vast and dizzy success, then that success was hollow as well as it was vast, a colossal and preposterous nothing. How accurate was Mencken? How did Valentino feel about his own fame? For the purposes of this presentation, I will ask specifically, what did fame mean to Rodolfo Guglielmi before he became famous, before indeed he became Valentino? To pursue this last question, I would like to turn first of all to an essay Rodolfo Guglielmi wrote in 1908 when he was 13 years old. This is 13 years old, about a year after this photo was taken. This has been published, I think it was first published in the photo play autobiography. He's 13 years old at the Collegio per Eurofani dei Sanitari, a boarding school in Perugia, 300 miles from his home in Toronto. This essay is among the few sentimental papers, including his mother's letters, that Rodolfo took with him to the United States. So it was very important to him. The essay is titled, The Regiment Passes, and describes a rapturous send-off for soldiers departing for Africa, where Italy had colonial interests from 1885 to 1896. While Rodolfo found the dredging reality of the boarding school's military-style discipline nearly unbearable, his essay shows that this is nothing to dampen his enthusiasm for the romance of soldiering. This rare example of Rodolfo's juvenilia is a testament to his idealizing tendencies and fervid imagination, and is remarkably prescient of his later fame. And here's the essay. Clearly you can see that this is the essay that he wrote when he was 13 years old, and he signed it, Argu Yelmi, down there. Okay, so I'll read sections of this. So Rodolfo begins his essay. The parade was supposed to start at 10 o'clock, and this is the only thing I didn't translate. I translated the other letters. I had to get help with this because it was so difficult to read. Um, but I, I tried to maintain um, his, his grammar and his um, sentence structure and wording. Uh, the parade was supposed to start at 10 o'clock. The tiers of the best seats were already dark with uniforms, multicolored with the ladies' sparkling apparel, all swarming like a huge hive. A sea of people into which flowed many streams was rolling, roaring, turning throughout the entire square in front of the Admiralty. In the houses whose windows faced the square, it seemed that all the inhabitants were amassed and that they were about to squirt out the windows like liquid drops compressed between joints, and the terraces looked like window boxes overflowing with flowers. A cordon of guards and carabinieri kept the people at a respectful distance in front of the Admiralty building and along the streets that the soldiers would pass through. On the stroke of 10, announced by a hundred bugle blasts and welcomed by applause that sounded like the running fire of a division, the admiral appeared. 
The band played and the immense crowd first jolted as if an electric discharge ran through it, then went profoundly silent for a few seconds. The commander of the first division marched on." Unquote. It is telling that Rodolfo opens his essay neither with the heated battle scene nor with soldiers at all, but with the crowd nearly hysterical with adulation. Described here, amorphous, roiling, its potential violence barely contained, it is a powerful and power bestowing force. The dominating presence of the crowd suggests that Rodolfo might have felt that while an individual might satisfy personal honor on the battlefield, the soldier's fame could be conferred only by the adoring masses. And to an adventure-loving 13-year-old boy, what was private glory without public acknowledgement, without fame? In comparing the applause of the crowd to the gunfire of the battlefield, Rodolfo transforms the parade itself into a virtual theater of war. Before the metaphorical onslaught of the crowd, the soldiers are enacting in advance the valor they will display on the battlefield, but that will be unseen by any spectator. With each side, spectator and soldier, providing a necessary half, the parade is at once the celebration and the proxy for a distant and, yet, and as yet unfought encounter. Next, Rodolfo describes the entry of the troops, first sail sailors, then soldiers. He writes, How well those strong and robust young men were walking with their suntan faces and their steel muscles, those sons of the Navy, and to think that they are all ready to give their life to save the country if endangered, men who would fall on the deck cut down by grape shot, and who would die with a smile, happy to have given their arms and life for the salvation of Italy. As agile as monkeys on the rigs, as strong as horses, as kind as a maiden, sailors are loved by everyone. Then the soldiers. How many of them have died on the battlefield amid the rattle of musketry and the thunder of cannon? How many of them have gone to the inhospitable African land, victim of their own self-sacrifice? And finally, how many of them died under the rubble to help others?" Unquote. The appearance of the men leads away from the present to a premonition of their death. It is not the soldier's willingness to kill that causes such emotion but their eagerness to die. Like the characters Valentina would later play in films such as Blood and Sand and The Sheik, the soldiers derive an erotic potency from their courtship of death, an erotic response tinged as it is here with an intriguing combination of maternal protectiveness and barely suppressed bloodlust on the part of the adoring audience. It is nearly impossible to avoid thinking of the swarms of riotous fans that choked Broadway outside of Campbell's funeral home in 1926 to mourn the death of the first mass media superstar. The young Rodolfo's fascination with being an officer, which he, discuss, which he discusses not just here but in letter after letter, was part of a larger fantasy of escaping the state confines of his petty bourgeois life, with its emphasis on duty and its imperative not to overreach, but rather to pursue a safe, respectable course. Rodolfo felt, as he would often say, that Italy was too small for him. He was con Collection. Um, this is a photo of Rodolfo taken in Taranto in 1913, right before he left to come to America. Um, he's 18 years old, and he's um, interestingly he's posing in his new evening clothes. Um, he did not rent a tuxedo, as the myth has it. Um, his mother actually gave him a full wardrobe before he left for Italy, 
And so you often see him in, in this evening dress. Um, and we see him looking very much like a kid playing dress up is, is always what I think of when I see this. Um, but you can see how much he wanted to be the upper class man of the world, um, you know, monocle and, and all. <laughs> and um, on, on the other is a postcard from the um, Cleveland, the SS Cleveland, which is the ship that he took um, from Italy to the United States. Okay. So it is in this light we should read Rudolfo's decision to leave Italy rather than, and this has been said, although it hasn't really stuck, <laughs> rather than the desperate bid for a better life, Rudolfo's departure was more the wanderlust of a middle-class romantic who was chafing at the restraints of his dull provincial world. Once in the United States, however, Rudolfo confronted an unexpected and devastating twist. It had never occurred to him that he would be grouped indiscriminately with the thousands of other Italians who had come to America as economic refugees. The Guglielmi's correspondence fre frequently reflects their sense of their utter difference from the lower classes. Very overt about this. Um, Gabrielle Guglielmi, um, Rodolfo's mother, for example, refers to third-class train passengers as, quote, that race that I find repulsive, unquote. <laughs> and Rodolfo himself, in justifying his decision to travel first class to America, expresses his disdain for all the, quote, uncouth people, unquote, in second class, adding, how I would have suffered had I stayed there. Indeed, Rodolfo was shocked that New Yorkers did not instantly recognize him as a gentleman, that the differences that separated the middle class from the peasant class in southern Italy were not so easily detectable across the ocean. Wor worse, Rodolfo now found that the manners and charm, the bella figura that Gabrielle had worked so hard to instill in her son, were in New York turned against him, taken as evidence of his imposture as mimicry, as a mere veneer of good breeding. Does that five make this full screen? There is no Never mind. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so here's an early, um, it's a really rare um, photograph of um, Rudolfo taken around 1915. His handwriting on his photographs gets better as he gets older. Um, and it's dedicated to his mother. So this is from, um, this was taken in New York in 1915. Um, again, in the same evening dress. If Rodolfo Guglielmi had dreamed of winning glory on the battlefield or on the sands of some mysterious land, his first real taste of fame, if only a modest celebrity, came from dancing on the vaudeville stage. Quickly leaving the ranks of New York's taxi dancers, he became the partner of the famous Bonnie Glass and the even more famous Joan Sawyer. However, his dance career further served to trap him in stereotypes he abhorred. Even though he was earning a considerable salary and living the high life in one of the world's most energetic and emergent cities, in letters to his family, and I found this surprising, Rodolfo looked back on this period with considerable bitterness. Um, here's another um, rare photo. I don't, it's not the best. resolution of, of Rodolfo and Bonnie Glass when they were dancing together. Um, not sure if this is the Cafe Montmartre. I'm not sure what club this is. Um, so, and this is probably around 1915. Um, the cultural disdain for men who danced for a living was particularly stinging because Rodolfo shared some of these opinions. Not that he was ashamed to display his good looks and elegant clothes, nor was he ashamed he was a graceful dancer. 
Indeed, from childhood, his mother had encouraged his investment in his image, often rhapsodizing over his handsomeness. Oh, how I think of you when I see those elegant soldiers in their white uniforms, she wrote in 1909 when Rodolfo was applying to the Naval Academy in Venice. And musing over a later photograph taken when Rodolfo was in Hollywood, and um, this is another one that's been published. one to his mother as well. This is to my great-grandfather. Um, musing over this photograph, um, his mother would write, think of us often, Rodolfino mio. Think of me. Talk to me as you do in your beautiful photograph, in which I love to contemplate your profound and clear gaze, as if I can read the depths of your heart. How chic you are in every respect. How handsome in that striped suit. The photogenic presence that would, lay, that would soon enthrall the whole world was not lost on Gabriel Guglielmi. But while Rodolfo basked in others' admiration, the difference between performing within a social context and performing on stage for money was immense particularly given the values of his family, which had grown more important to him in proportion to his unhappiness with America. It is significant that later, when Rodolfo was briefly employed as a bond salesman in San Francisco in 1917, um, which is given in Photoplay and is indeed true, his mother referred to a photograph of Rodolfo and Bonnie Glass dressed as a posh dancers. Um, which we'll see here. So this is um, another photograph from our collection. Um, dressed up as a posh dancers, and um, I believe that's Bonnie Glass. Um, and his mother would write of this photo, and I find this interesting. How very bad you looked in that suit. <laughs> Veritably one of those horrible boulevardiers. Ah, how happy I am that you have left the stage for a serious career, lucrative and very dignified, even though you really have to earn your money now. Gabrielle's contempt for her son's life on the stage and the paragraphs she devoted to describing the war efforts of her, his brother and cousins surely deepened Rodolfo's own dissatisfaction and frustration with his situation. Already surfeited on the dubious pleasures of Broadway, Rodolfo's New York saga reached its unbearable climax in 1916 when he was wrongfully arrested in connection with the white slavery investigation. The charges were dropped, and he was quick, quickly released from jail. The arrest itself, however, however, bothered Rodolfo far less than the press coverage of it. While every newspaper, the New York Times, the Herald, the Evening Journal, and the World, clearly stated that Rodolfo Guglielmi had not been accused of a crime, they came close to libeling him in most every other way, particularly by slurring his manhood and more subtly his ethnicity, repeatedly characterizing him as a man dancer, gratuitously observing that he wore a corset and even more effeminate at the time, a wristwatch deriding, um, a wristwatch, um, and deriding his claim to be a marquee. This is um, sort of a foreshadowing to the Pink Powder Puff editorial, um, his reaction to it. Um, here proclaimed on every newsstand was an attack that hit Rodolfo at his most vulnerable, exposing all the painful indignities he had privately endured since arriving in New York. The scandal destroyed his reputation. More than any other incident, it was his association with white slavery that branded Rodolfo a gigolo or worse. And for the rest of his life, he could never completely escape its stigma. Frequently in letters home, he would say that the scandal began his years of, quote, desperate struggle, unquote. 
even lamenting in a letter written to his family in 1919 that, quote, years of painful fighting in America have made a different man out of me. And I am sure that when you see me again, you will not recognize the same person, the same incorrigible and heedless boy who left Italy. Rodolfo became obsessed with vindication. He wanted justice from the newspapers that had libeled him. But to restore his tarnished reputation, Rodolfo instinctively turned to the very concrete prospect of entering World War I. While he never ceased to romanticize the idea of becoming an officer, Rodolfo's desire for military glory had taken on far greater significance than it had for him in Italy. It was a means of both asserting his masculinity and also of asserting his Italian identity against an American culture which had disillusioned him and of which he had grown increasingly contemptuous. When R Rodolfo left New York for the West Coast in the spring of 1917, he was determined to leave the stage. He knew an avenue that suited his taste for the spectacular. He would join the ranks of the modern knights of the battles, battlefield. He would become an aviator. It is not incidental, I think, that Rodolfo wanted to be a pilot specifically. He was adamant about this, even though his mother, who did support his desire to enlist, begged him repeatedly not to enter this arm of the service. Um, quotation from his mother again. I don't have the whole letter here, but just this is in, in this letter. Um, um, this is from Gabrielle to Rodolfo. She writes, and it's from October 30th, 1917. Though I understand your youthful ardor to become a dashing aviator, I know, however, that all of them, I say all of them, end up in an early grave. If not for you, save yourself for me, who has my hope for old age in you. I would let much letter, I would much, I would like much better to see you in the artillery. But Rodolfo was resolute. He knew very well that fighting in the what fighting in the trenches meant, filth, horror, tedium, and anonymity. The pilot, on the other hand, still retained the daring adventurous, the chivalry, even a strain of anti-authoritarianism that arguably characterizes Rodolfo's adolescent essay. Honor and individual fame were still possible in the battle waged in the sky. To Gabriel's relief, however, Rodolfo's plans to enlist as a pilot were thwarted when he failed to pass the eye exam. The paper trail extending from childhood and through the armistice shows that for Rodolfo, war never lost its sanctity. It was no less true for the young man of 20 than it had been for the 13-year-old schoolboy who had romanticized the bloody debacle in Abyssinia into an elegy for the zeal of youth. The willingness to die for a cause was a self-sanctifying act. Moreover, Rodolfo tacitly understood that he could counter the American stereotype that had trapped him, that of the foreign-born lounge lizard, the ill-bred and illiterate Italian by becoming one of the, quote, strong and robust young men to show that it was the Italian, not the American, who was the real man at this point in his life. Um, this is no more evident than in a letter Valentino wrote to his sister-in-law, my great-grandmother, Ada Guglielmi Valentino, a week after the armistice in November 17, 1919. Which I have an image of. This is a letter he wrote to my her grandmother. It's many pages, but this is um, the first page. Uh, before discussing the war, Rodolfo first turns his attention to American women. Casting off his courtly lover self in a fit of bitter humor, he, uh, assuring Ada that he is loyal to Italy, Valentino writes, 
American women are very practical and very easy to get and even easier to lose. Reassure yourself that there will never be a chance of goodbye, goodbye forever, my beautiful Italy. Because if it is delightful to have an amorous adventure with these women, when it comes to marriage, I am, thank God, too Latin to adapt myself to their point of view of unlimited marital independence. I would not want to be in the same position as their poor American husbands who, when they see that their wives are going out to a show with a boyfriend, they wish them to have a good time. <laughs> setting, setting aside the irony of this passage in light of his later marriages, Volantito's critique of the marital dynamics in the United States is also ironic in that it parallels the concerns of his own detractors who would later, who would later denounce the great lover uh, and that both center around, around the notion that modern women were out of control, blazonly flaunting their sexual freedom with a shocking nonchalance toward the sacred institution of marriage. Valentino maintains that it is, it is his very Latinness, so lacking in the milk toast American husband, that enables him to fix the donna mobile in her place. Continuing his letter, Rodolfo immediately turns from American women I don't think incidentally, to um, longing for his homeland and um, also not incidentally, he immediately ties this to military patriotism. Um, he writes, I also ask myself, and I've asked myself the same question for the last four years from the moment in which I arrived in this country. When will I be able to see my dear ones? When will I be able to see the beautiful skies of my dear Italy. And every time that I read in the newspapers the wonderful victories of the Italian army, a shiver goes down my spine. Pride and enthusiasm flow through my veins with the regret that I cannot be there to lend an arm, lend a hand. Here in America, people do not appreciate the strong and magnificent effort of the Italian army. And this makes me furious. Believe me, the day in which they celebrated the armistice, my heart and thoughts were in Italy. Ah, I would have given a year of my life to have been in my homeland. End quote. Um, here is a theme that we see um, in these letters repeatedly in Rodolfo's early years. To be redeemed from the treacherous sexuality of American women, from love affairs gone awry, from aspersions cast on his character, or from whatever failing or scandal of his own, Rodolfo instinctively turns to military valor, longing, as he had since he was very young, to be a celebrated hero. Projecting his own youthful ambitions onto his little nephew, my grandfather, um, Jean, uh, Valentino writes, I can see Jean already grown in a military uniform of the cavalry, a dream that I have always had. If he takes after me, he will love horses and military uniforms. This was the sort of fame that Valentino understood and wanted at this point. Um, and significantly, he never once mentions in his letters any sort of desire for film stardom, as new a concept as this was, or any sort of stardom associated with being on the stage, um, whether as a dancer or as an actor. And of course, this is in the wake of his mother's death, um, which might have something to do with it. But Rodolfo certainly saw how the stars in Hollywood lived, how they were revered, and he does mention around this time that he was beginning to make a name for himself and that he desires Hollywood success but only as a means to an end, as a way of making a living until he had enough money to buy land and live the life of a wealthy man of leisure. The irony, of course, is that although Valentino would never find redemption and honor on the battlefields of Europe, he would ascend to movie stardom by playing a character who did. The role of Giulio would catapult Valentino to fame, thus giving him the vindication and acclaim that did if only for a while, restore his reputation. 
In the Four Horsemen, Valentino found the role that most re closely resembled his own experience. Perhaps sensing the actor's conviction, the press and movie fans projected the fictional, fictional character's heroism onto Valentino. Soon afterward, however, came The Sheik, a film that would raise some of the issues he thought he had laid to rest. <laughs>